to welcome the Prime Minister, Mr. Joshi. Honorable Prime Minister of India, uh, Shri Narendra Modi ji, uh, Shri M. Jagbar ji, Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs, Presidents, Prime Ministers, Ministers in the audience, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and guests uh, from all over the world, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to the second Raisana Dialogue, co-hosted by the Ministry of External Affairs and the Observer Research Foundation. If you recall, the dialogue first met in March 2016, and it would have been an understatement now to say that the last 10 months have been rather tumultuous. Be it technology, be it society, be it politics, disruption is a new watchword. Uh, the certitudes of the past few decades have been constantly challenged and they've been called into question. But then we are all optimists assembled here, and we hope that this is a creative disruption. And we're gathered here to talk about the emergence of the new order from within the mists of this uncertainty. And we believe that while the shape of the institutions, the protocols and the regimes that will claim the new world may be uncertain, what is certain is that this is a seminal moment. This is a moment that is going to shape the future of our shared planet for the rest of the 21st century. Our respected Prime Minister, I recall that when we had called upon you to brief you about this platform, you had expressed great interest in our theme for this particular dialogue, the search for a new normal. In this uncertain world, the shifting dynamic between multipolarity and multilateralism places far greater urgency to find that new normal which will push forward our shared global concerns for security, prosperity, and peace. Since May 2014, the world has been witnessing a new India, a more confident India, an India that is bringing a new dynamism and energy in its engagements with the world. In more ways than one, the spirit, sir, that you have infused into India's foreign policy really reflects the demographic essence of this nation, the vigor of its youth, of a nation invested in the future of the world. And in keeping with the same spirit, we acted upon your suggestion to bring in young minds with fresh ideas into this dialogue. This year, we have therefore introduced our Young Leaders Program as an integral component of the Raisina Dialogue. So our audience today also has 39 Raisina Young Fellows, all under 35 years of age, from 26 countries representing between them every continent of this planet. And this is precisely what the Raisina Dialogues are all about, about the role of emerging global leadership in finding common pathways. So the Raisana Dialogue may be a platform designed, built, and located in India, but it is a platform that is dedicated to the citizens and the nations of this world. In that sense, it belongs not to us, but to each and every of the hundreds of international delegates who have traveled from 65 nations to assemble here. Therefore, it is all the more our special privilege that you are here to initiate the rich conversations that we hope to host over the next few days. Your assessment of the region and the global order will lay the ground for the deliberations to follow. We are honored and thankful for support and presence here this evening. And with this, Mr. Prime Minister, may I please request you to address this distinguished gathering that has come to hear you. The floor is yours, sir. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, today 
seems to be a day of speeches. Just a while ago, we watched President Xi and Prime Minister May speak. And there, I am with my words. Perhaps an overdose for the intellectuals present here and a problem of plenty for the 24 by 7 media. It is a great privilege to speak to you at the inauguration of the second edition of the Raichina Dialogue. Excellency Karjai, Prime Minister Harper, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, it is a pleasure to see you in Delhi. Also, a warm welcome to all the guests. Over the next couple of days, you would hold numerous conversations on the state of the world around us. You would debate its certainty and prevailing flux, its conflicts and risks, its success and opportunities, its past behaviors and likely prognosis and its potential black savants and the new normals. Friends, in May 2014, the people of India also ushered in a new normal. My fellow Indians spoke in one voice to entrust my government with a mandate for change. Change not just of attitudes, but of mindset. Change from a state of deep to one of purposeful actions. Change to take bold decisions. A mandate in which reform would not be enough unless it transforms our economy and society. A transformation that is embedded in the aspirations and optimism of India's youth and in the boundless energy of its millions. Every day at work, I draw on this sacred energy. Every day at work, my to-do list is guided by the constant drive to reform and transform India for prosperity and security of all Indians. Friends, I'm aware that India's transformation is not separated from its external context. Our economic growth, the welfare of our farmers, the employment opportunities for our youth, our access to capital, technology, markets, and resources, and security of our nation. All of them are deeply impacted 
by developments in the world. But the reverse is also true. The world needs India's sustained rise as much as India needs the world. Our desire to change our country has an indivisible link with the external world. It is therefore only natural that India's choices at home and our international priorities form part of a seamless continuum. Firmly anchored in India's transformational goals, friends, India is pursuing its transformation in unsettled times, which is equally the result of human progress and violent turmoil. For multiple reasons, and at multiple levels, the world is going through profound changes. Globally connected societies, digital opportunities, technology shifts, knowledge boom, and innovation are leading the march of humanity. But sluggish growth and economic volatility are also a sobering fact. Physical borders may be less relevant in this age of bits and bytes, but wars within nations, a sentiment against trade and migration and rising parochial and protectionist attitude across the globe are also in stark evidence. The result, globalization gains are at risk and economic gains are no longer easy to come by. Instability, violence, extremism, exclusion, and transnational threats continue to proliferate in dangerous directions. And non-state actors are significant, significant contributors to the spread of such challenges. Institutions and architectures built for a different world by a different world are outdated. Posing a barrier to effective multilateralism as the world begins to reorder itself a quarter century after the strategic clarity of the Cold War, the dust has not yet settled on what has replaced it. But a couple of things are clear. The political and military power is diffused and distributed. The multipolarity of the world and an increasingly multipolar Asia is a dominant fact today. And we welcome it because it captures the reality of the rise of many nations. It accepts that voices of many not views of a few should shape the global agenda. Therefore, we need to guard against any inclination 
that promotes exclusion especially in asia the focus of this conference on multilateralism with multipolarity in thus timely friends we inhabited a strategically complex environment in the broad sweep of history the changing world is not necessarily a new situation the crucial question is how do nations act in a situation where the frames of reference are shifting rapidly our choices and actions are based on the strength of our national power our strategic intent is shaped by our civilizational ethos of yatharthavad realism sa astitva coexistence सहयोग कोऑपरेशन तथा सहभागिता पार्टनरशिप दिस फ्रेंड्स दिस फाइंड्स एक्सप्रेशन इन ए क्लियर एंड रिस्पॉन्सिबल आर्टिकुलेशन ऑफ अवर नेशनल इंटरेस्ट द प्रॉस्पेरिटी ऑफ इंडियंस बोथ एट होम एंड अब्रॉड and security of our citizens are of paramount importance but self interest alone is neither in our culture nor in our behavior our actions and aspirations capacity and human capital democracy and demography and strength and success will continue to be an anchor for all round regional and global progress our economic and political rise represents a regional and global opportunity of great significance it is a force for peace a factor for stability an engine for regional and global prosperity for my government this has meant a path of international engagement on rebuilding connectivity restoring bridges and rejoining india with our immediate and extended geographies shaping relationships network with india's economic priorities making india a human resource to be reckoned with by connecting our talented youth to global needs and opportunities building development partnerships that extend from the islands of the indian ocean and pacific to the islands of the caribbean and from the great continents of africa to the americas creating indian narratives on global challenges helping reconfigure reinvigorate and rebuild global institutions and organizations spreading the benefits of india's civilizational legacies including yoga and ayurveda as a global good transformation therefore is not just a domestic focus it encompasses our global agenda for me sabka saath sabka vikas 
is not just a vision for India. It is a belief for the whole world. And it manifests itself in several layers, multiple themes, and different geographies. Let me turn to those that are closest to us in terms of geography and shared interests. We have seen a major shift towards our neighbors captured in our determined neighborhood first approach. The people of South Asia are joined by blood, shared history, culture, and aspirations. The optimism of its youth seeks change, opportunities, progress, and prosperity. A thriving, well-connected, and integrated neighborhood is my dream. In the last two and a half years, we have partnered with almost all our neighbors to bring the region together. Where necessary, we have shared the burdens of our past for the progressive future of our region. The result of our efforts is there to see. In Afghanistan, despite distance and difficulties in transit, our partnership assists in reconstruction by building institutions and capabilities. In the backdrop of shifting politics, our security engagement has deepened. The completion of Afghanistan's parliament building and the India-Afghanistan Friendship Dam are two signing examples of our dedication to force develop developmental partnership. With Bangladesh, we have achieved get, greater convergence and political understanding through connectivity and infrastructure projects and significantly the settlement of the land and maritime boundaries. In Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan and Maldives, our overall engagement in infrastructure, connectivity, energy and development projects is a source of progress and stability in the region. My vision for our neighborhood puts a premium on peaceful and harmonious ties with the entire South Asia. That vision had led me to invite leaders of all South nations, including Pakistan, by my swearing in. For this vision, I had also traveled to Lahore. But India alone cannot walk the path of peace. It also has to be Pakistan's journey to make. Pakistan must walk away from terror if it wants to walk towards dialogue with India. Ladies and gentlemen, Further west, we have redefined in a short span of time and despite uncertainty and conflict, our partnership with Gulf and West Asia, including South, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar and Iran. Next week, I will have the pleasure to host His Highness the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi at the Chief Guest at India's Republic Day. We have not just focused on changing the perception, we have also changed the reality of our times. This has helped us protect and promote 
our security interests, nurture strong economic and energy ties, and advance the material and social welfare of around 8 million Indians. In Central Asia too, we have built our ties on the edifice of shared history and culture to unlock vistas of prosperous partnership. Our membership of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization provides a strong institutional link to our engagement with Central Asian nations. We have invested in all-round prosperity of our Central Asian brothers and sisters and have brought about a successful reset to long-standing relationship in that region. To our East, our engagement with Southeast Asia is at the center of our Act East policy. We have built a close engagement with the institutional structures in the region such as the East Asia Summit. Our partnership with ASEAN and its member countries have served to enhance commerce, technology, investment, development, and security partnerships with the region. It has also advanced our broad strategic interest and stability in the region. In our engagement with China, as President Xi and I agreed, we have sought to tap the vast area of commercial and business opportunities in the relationship. I see the development of India and China as an unprecedented opportunity for our two countries and for the whole world. At the same time, it is not unnatural for two large neighboring powers to have some differences. In the management of our relationship and for peace and progress in the region, both our countries need to show sensitivity and respect for each other's core concerns and interests. Friends, prevailing wisdom tells us that this century belongs to Asia. The sharpest trajectory of change is happening in Asia. There are large and vibrant pools of progress and prosperity spread across the landscape of this region. But rising ambition and rivalries are generating visible stress points. The steady increase in military power, resources, and wealth in the Asia-Pacific has raised the stakes of its security. Therefore, the security architecture in the region must be open, transparent, balanced, and inclusive, and promote dialogue and predictable behavior rooted in international norms and respect for sovereignty. Friends, over the past two and a half years, we have given a strong momentum to our engagement with the United States, Russia, Japan, and other major global powers. With them, we not only share a desire to cooperate. We also hold converging views on opportunities and challenges that face us. These partnerships 
are a good fit with India's economic priorities and defense and security. With the United States, our actions have brought speed, substance, and strength to the entire spectrum of engagement. In my conversation with President-elect Donald Trump, we agreed to keep building on these gains in our strategic partnership. Russia is an abiding friend. President Putin and I have held long conversations on the challenges that confront the world today. Our trusted and strategic partnership, especially in the field of defense, has deepened. Our investments in new drivers of our relationship and the emphasis on energy, trade, and science and technology linkages are showing successful results. We also enjoy a truly strategic, strategic partnership with Japan, whose contrasts now stretch to all fields of economic activity. Prime Minister Abe and I have spoken of our determination to intensify our cooperation further. With Europe, we have a vision of strong partnership in India's development, especially in knowledge industry and smart urbanization. Friends, India has for decades been at the forefront of sharing our capacities and strengths with fellow developing countries. With our brothers and sisters in Africa, we have further strengthened our ties in the last couple of years and built meaningful development partnership on the solid foundation of decades of traditional friendship and historical links. Today, the footprint of our development partnership strategy all across the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, India has a long history of being a maritime nation. In all directions, our maritime interests are strategic and significant. The arc of influence of Indian Ocean extends well beyond its littoral limits. Our initiatives of Sagar, security and growth for all in the region is not just limited to safeguarding our mainland and islands. It defines our efforts to deepen economic and security cooperation in our maritime relationships. We know that convergence, cooperation, and collective actions will advance economic activity and peace in our maritime region. We also believe that the primary responsibility of our peace prosperity and security in the Indian Ocean rests with those who live in this region. Ours is not an exclusive approach and we aim to bring countries together on the basis of respect for international law. We believe that respecting freedom of navigation and ad adhering to international norms is essential for peace and economic growth in the larger and interlinked marine geography of the Indo-Pacific. Friends, we appreciate the compelling logic of regional connectivity for peace, progress, and prosperity. In our choices and through our actions, we have sought to overcome 
barriers to our outreach to West and Central Asia and eastward to Asia Pacific. Two clear and successful examples of this are the tripartite agreement with Iran and Afghanistan on Chabahar and our commitment to bring online the International North-South Transport Corridor. However, equally, connectivity in itself cannot overdrive or undermine the sovereignty of other nations. Only by respecting the sovereignty of countries involved can regional connectivity corridors fulfill their promise and avoid differences and discord. Friends, due to our traditions, we have shouldered the international burden of our commitments. We have laid assistance and relief efforts in times of disaster. We were a credible first responder during the earthquake in Nepal, evacuation from Yemen, and during humanitarian crisis in the Maldives and Fiji. We have also not hesitated in soldering our responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. We have increased collaboration on coastal surveillance, wide shipping information, and fighting non-traditional threats like piracy, smuggling, and organized crime. We have also saved alternative narratives on long-standing global challenges. Our strong belief in delinking terrorism from religion and rejecting artificial distinction between good and bad terrorism are now a global talking point. And those in our neighbors who support violence, hatred, and export terror tend isolated and ignored. On the other pressing challenge of global warming, we have moved into a leading role. We have an ambitious agenda and equally aggressive target to generate 175 gigawatts from renewable energy. And we have already made a good start. We have shared our civilizational traditions to promote harmonious living with nature. We also brought the international community together to create an international solar alliance to harness the energy of sun to propel human growth. A high point of our efforts had been the revival of international interests in the cultural and spiritual richness of India's civilizational stream. Today, Buddhism, Yoga, and Ayurveda are recognized as invaluable heritage of humanity as a whole. India will celebrate this common heritage every step of the way. As it builds bridges across countries and regions and promotes overall well-being, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this in conclusion, in connecting with the world, our ancient scriptures have guided us. Rig Veda says, Ano Bhadro Kratvo Yantu Vishwataha. Let noble thoughts come to me from all directions. As a society, we have always favored needs of many over the want of one and preferred partnerships over polarization. We hold the belief that success of one must propel the growth of many. 
our task is cut out and our vision is clear our journey of transformation begins at home and is strongly supported through our constructive and collaborative partnership that span the globe with resolute steps at home and expanding network of reliable friendships abroad we will grasp the promise of a future that belongs to over a billion indians and in this endeavor you will find in india my friends a beacon of peace and progress stability and success and access and accommodation thank you thank you very much thanks a lot may I now request the honorable minister of state shri mg akbar to propose a vote of thanks Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to vote, move a vote of thanks to the Honourable Prime Minister of India. He has just, before you, laid out the ideological vision as well as the intellectual framework of a transformed and transforming foreign policy that meets the requirements. of a fast evolving and changing india in essence all foreign policy has to be an extension of the national interest and the national interest at the moment has clearly encapsulated by the prime minister himself is a vision and a search for prosperity that was the message of the 2014 election and that message is epitomized in the personality the philosophy and the policies of the prime minister himself the two words that he used most often in his speech were peace and prosperity they were repeated often and often and reflected the great and intense desire but as he said our vision of prosperity is a shared vision sabka saath sabka vikas and sab extends across uh, the harmony that we look for but this much i think we must make clear while we want peace we want the peace of a garden not the peace of a graveyard and today the threat to peace without peace there is no prosperity the threat to peace comes from a big beast we think of big powers that's one of the subjects of our deliberations over the next two days but one of the many big powers which has emerged we don't quite recognize it is this power of terrorism a big beast an evil that is threatening turbulence across areas which uses fear as the stimulus for devastation and chaos we are on the frontiers of the war against terrorism and we are in this process being led by a man who actually brought this theme out consistently from the very beginning of his mission to serve which is two and a half years ago and what he repeated and said has today become one uh, a part of the recognition that the world has given thank you very much sir for providing such a stimulating beginning to our deliberations Uh, we have begun really at a very high point now it is for the rest of us to try and reach the levels of from the, of the starting point thank you can i request you all to remain in the room as the prime minister leaves 